Good morning. Happy 4th of July weekend to you all. Thank you for being here. Uh, we're going to focus on communion this morning, something that, um, I don't know if you're like me, in our tradition of churches, we don't uh, really, oftentimes I don't um, really give it its due focus. Um, and some of you might uh, relate to that. I, it sometimes feel like in our tradition, it's kind of an add-on. Um, I don't know if you feel that way or not. And, and so I, I, I want us to go back to the scriptures and get some instruction specifically on the topic of why uh, we break bread and why we celebrate uh, the blood of Jesus. And so that's really where I want to go. Uh, to relate this to the book of Acts, since we're in a series like that, I thought I'd better go to that book at least as a starting point. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it says that this early church, 3,000 souls give their life to Jesus Christ, it says in verse 41. In verse, in verse 42, it says, and, so there's supposed to be kind of a continual uh, statement there. It's not just period, new paragraph. It's in the same paragraph and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. And so I want to talk specifically this morning about having a devotion to breaking bread. What does that even mean? Um, how significant uh, was it for those first believers to have as part of their experience a devotion. Well, we can kind of understand their need, especially in our tradition of churches in 2022, we can understand a devotion to the apostles' teaching. Uh, in their day, that would have been a, a devotion to the written Old Testament and to the oral New Testament. The New Testament books hadn't been written at this point when, when these people were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. So we can understand that, right? And we can understand how significant and important it is to devote ourselves uh, to fellowship. I mean, it doesn't take long to know we need one another. Uh, there are just going to be some things in our life that, that we can only do when we are uh, joining up with some other people that have other talents and abilities and sometimes they're stronger than we are and sometimes we're stronger than they are. We just need one another. So we understand fellowship. And then breaking of the bread and then the last uh, devotion they had was a devotion to prayer. And we understand that too, right? Um, but to me, in my experience, we have not really thought through what it means to be devoted to the breaking of bread. And I just want to work on that with you today. Um, I was 13 years old, and I was uh, playing baseball. I was a pitcher, and I, and I had the incredible privilege um, of being a pitcher and being selected to, to pitch an all-star game in Rockford, Illinois. It was the east side of Rockford against the west side of Rockford. And um, in this game... Um, now, and I had been pitching for about four or five years. I started as a little boy, and I'm, I'm, not, I, I'm not really good at it. I'm good enough at it at this age, but I am absolutely dedicated to the art. Um, as a matter of fact, in our backyard, um, there were two patches, and my dad um, sat on a, on a five-gallon bucket, and he would just have his catcher's mitt, and then I was on the other side of the yard, and we would play catch constantly. I'm sure my dad uh, was tired of it. We played catch. As a matter of fact, I have a new shoulder that I got in 2017 because I probably, and, and you know what, and now that I'm, I'm back at it, and I have three, three of my four grandkids love to play catch, and so I am throwing. I've even had to teach myself to throw left-handed because this one wears out, right? But I'm dedicated, I'm devoted to pitching to the point where my mom fell in love with the sport so much that she began keeping um, score books for me. And so when I got into, um, when I got a little bit more competitive in it, she even learned how to chart my pitches. She could tell if it was a change up a fastball. She could tell if it was a knuckle drop ball. She could tell if it was a screw, a screw, screwdriver, <laughs> a screw ball, uh, which is now called um, something different. Um, and now, and then I also had a curveball. And so she, but she could tell. And so she would chart pitches. And when I turned 40, 
just a couple years ago, she sent me a box filled with all this memorabilia, including all the stats that she had kept when, when I was playing baseball. It's a beautiful gift for me, and I, um, I cherish that. It was an all-star game, and we were winning three to two, and it was the last inning. It was a set, we played seven innings, seventh inning, and I was pitching, and I had just thrown two strikes against Ira Matthews. Ira Matthews was on the east side of the river. I was on the west side of the river. And I had struck him out earlier um, in the game. And Ira Matthews, he, he was their best um, athlete. And, um, and my dad would, ha- would sit in Royal Gale Park in Rockford, Illinois, and he'd sit at a place right behind the catcher and up a few um, seats where I could see him if I wanted to look at him and, and get, some, get some feedback on what I should pitch. And I looked up at him, and he said, you need to throw um, a changeup out of the strike zone. And um, Dad didn't know this, but I shook him off. And in baseball, that means, no, I'm not going to do that. Uh, give me another pitch. And so I threw a fastball, and Ira Matthews hit it over the fence, and they won the game 4-3. to three. That, that, And, and that, that was sad, right? But this, I have a golden memory about this time because when it was time for, you know, we, we were, the game was over and I was walking back out to the car with my mom and dad. And I'll never forget, my dad put in his arm around me and said, you pitched a great game today. Right? Uh, first of all, there, there, there is um, many things that I know as an adult that I have grown up uh, to understand where the real devotion is. De- there's a devotion to baseball, that's awesome. A devotion to an art, that's awesome. You've got to work at it, and there's, there's, a, there's a lot of um, uh, emotional and relational and character muscles that are developed within devotion. Um, but that's a golden memory for me um, of my dad's devotion to me as a, uh, as a person, not as a pitcher. Um, it meant a lot to me. And so the Lord, in kind of a fatherly way, is putting his arm around you and me and saying, these are really the things that are most important in life. My word, fellowship, the breaking of bread, and prayer. And I'm asking you uh, to devote yourself to those things. Let's pray. So Lord, thank you for some time uh, together in your word. Thank you that your word is life. Uh, Thank you, Father, that it's living, it's active, it's just as able today as in any other century to have its way in us if we'll um, open our hearts, our minds to you and say, have your way in us, Lord. And so would you um, speak to me, would you speak through me as we look at this topic of breaking bread? In the name of Jesus, amen. I believe that the Lord's table drives home two truths that are supposed to be with you and with me as followers of Jesus all of the time. The first truth is this. You and I are far worse off than we can fathom. That's the first truth. The first truth of really understanding the breaking of bread is that you and I are far worse off than we can fathom. The second truth is this. We are of far greater worth than we can imagine. How can those two things be true at the same time? Well, they are. And there are paradox maybe in our relationship with people. Um, As a matter of fact, you could argue that when Jesus Christ established his church and when he began to help us understand what the standards are in Christianity as his follower, you could argue that the watermark of Christianity is that his followers would love their enemies. Would you agree with that? It's easy, Jesus says, to love people that love you. I want to show you a love that is beyond human reason. First of all, I want you to know how much I love you, even though you are far worse off than you could ever imagine, Joe McConkie. I still want you to know that you are of far greater value than you could ever imagine. And those two things need, I think, to be held in tension if we're going to understand Christianity. 
And particularly if we're going to understand why, what significance the breaking of bread has. And so to do that, I want us to look at a passage in Romans chapter 7, on into 8, and then we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 7. Romans chapter 7, verse 22 starts like this. It says, For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. It's qualified as an in my inner being. I, I get it. In my gut, I know that the right way to live is to put no other God before God. Have no idols. Don't take his name in vain. I understand that I need to be committed to a life of taking a Sabbath rest. I need to understand that murder is not okay, that adultery is not okay, that stealing is not okay, that coveting is not okay. I need to know, and I know in my gut, in my inner being, that the law is really good, right? And I just gave you nine of the Ten Commandments because I forgot one of them. Um, So... (laughs) <laughs> and you're like, yeah, you did. You know, and you're like, no, you know which one I forgot. And you're like, what an idiot up there. Doesn't he even know the Ten Commandments, right? <laughs> but you know what? I, you have no idea. I am far worse off than you could ever imagine. <laughs> and I, have, I am of far greater value than you could ever imagine. And so are you. And so is every human being that you've ever met. I, I think this, these are the lens through which God wants us to see ourselves, but God wants us also to see every other human being. Would you agree with that? I'm not saying that it's easy, but at least biblically speaking, at least through the lens of the gospel message, wouldn't you say that that true is every human being you ever met is far worse off than they could ever fathom and that they are far, a far greater worth than they could ever imagine. This is what breaking your bread is supposed to do. And so, back to Romans 7. So in my inner being, I I delight in the law of God, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin. There's this law of God and there's this law of sin that both dwell in my life. And it creates this incredible frustration and captivity. I feel locked down in it. I know the right thing to do, but I end up doing the wrong thing. Can anybody in the room relate with Joe right now? And the very thing I don't want to do, I end up doing. Anybody? Okay, this side is not listening yet. (laughs) Right? I mean, it's, right, we're we're in this battle in our own head, our own mind, our own heart. And so this is going on, and then, and then, um, Verse 24, wretched man that I am, right? This is, this, is the, this is part of the gospel. I am far worse off than I could ever fathom. I'm a wretched man. And aren't you glad it doesn't stay there? Aren't you glad that you have a Father in heaven that doesn't keep us there in that captivity? We have a God who's come to rescue us. And wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Everyone that you know carries around in their body this body of death, right? And we know it. And it's easy sometimes to point out other people's faults, right? Anybody ever done that? No? But some of you in the room, it's much harder for you to see other people's faults, but you, all you think about is your own faults. And you can all, some of us in this room can also relate to that. If I was just better. And so these two things have to be held in tension and, and the paradox is not resolved in the scripture that you and I are far worse off than we could ever fathom and we're of far greater value <clears throat> than we could ever imagine. All the time. And it's true not only for you, it's also true for everyone else that you meet. <clears throat> Thanks be to God, verse 25, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, so then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, here we are, the tension again, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. And aren't you glad that the Holy Spirit had the Apostle Paul write chapter 8, that it didn't just end with this? And so there shouldn't be a chapter break because the first words in chapter 8 are therefore, 
There is therefore, talking about what just went on, because every human being has this dilemma operative in their thinking and in their heart and in their experience every moment of every day, there is therefore, you need to know now, no condemnation for, the, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Say what? I mean, all day long, all I do is I condemn myself and I condemn everybody else. Anybody relate? When I'm left to my flesh, all I can see is this horrendous world that we live in, right? That, that screams at me all day, the condemnation that I feel in my own soul, but also the condemnation that I have for, generally speaking, the culture. Huh? Anybody ever complained about culture here recently? <laughs> right? Th this is not the language of a, of a devotion to the breaking of bread. That, is not the, that does not have the final say for you as a believer in Jesus Christ. Are you hearing me? This is not where you and I have to sit. And so a devotion to the breaking of bread as it's intended in the scripture is to remind us of these two truths that, that stay um, alive and that there is another sheriff that has come to town and that's what Romans chapter 8 is about. There is therefore now no condemna condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Verse 2, for the law of the Spirit. Now there was a law of God in my mind and there's a law of sin in my flesh and now there, our writer is introducing us to a new law. And he says, for the law of the Spirit. There is this new sheriff that wants to come and, and marshal your life and give direction to your life, and dwell in you as a constant teacher, and a constant reminder, and a healer, and a way maker, and a promise keeper that lives in you. There's this new law of the Spirit has set you free in Christ from the law of sin and death. This does not mean that the tension, the paradox has been resolved. It's still there. But now in Christ, when the Holy Spirit comes into a person's life, they now also have the option to live under a different law, not a law of condemnation, either condemnation on yourself or condemnation on other people. That, Jesus says, is no way to live. And, would you, and you agree with that at least principally. To go around and complaining about everything or, or being totally shameful about yourself is not the lens through which God wants us to see, wants you to see yourself or, or other people. Would you agree with that? But do we struggle with it? Can we agree that all of us in the room struggle with this? If you, do, if you don't, you're probably not honest at some point. We struggle here. And so Christ, this law of the Spirit has set you free. You know, the freedom that we experienced from England in 1776 is one thing, right? And in some ways we, we, we're, we, we celebrate that, but we also know where we're at. You know, we've got what us humans can do with our greatest efforts. And it's fallen short, would you agree? And so there's this new law that is, that is to dwell inside the heart of every man and every woman, woman in Christ and in the church collectively, both here at Pleasant Valley, in our city, and around this nation. That is the place that we need to celebrate our liberation, is in the power of Jesus Christ. Would you agree or not? We're so quiet <laughs> about such significant things. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And so God has set up something for a human being to actually live in liberty, not under the law of God or under the law of sin, but under the law of the spirit. 
And that's why Jesus came and, and died and rose again for us, is to give us this other option in this world. And that's what we celebrate in the breaking of bread. So, so that these righteous requirements might, uh, might be fulfilled. Verse 5, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Mm. There's a lot at stake here if we do not not only understand what the breaking of bread means, but to actually live it out tomorrow morning when you wake up. That God wants me to view myself and view other people entirely different from the law of God or the law of sin. He wants me to put on a lens that says that because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, every human being that I ever meet has potential, has hope to come out of their mess into this life, but they need someone that would actually shine that in their eyes because they're believing it, they're walking it out, and there is nothing more powerful than a sermon, right? No. There's nothing more powerful than a life lived in obedience to the gospel message, and that's why we on an ongoing basis need to dedicate devote ourselves to the breaking of bread as it's intended in Scripture. And we're going to get there. Verse 9, You, however, are not in the flesh but in the Spirit, if, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him, Jesus. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. And it's not some spiritual only deal that Christ does in a human being. It's bodily. He wants his spirit to live in you bodily. It's not just kind of like, like the rest of the world in terms of the physical realm just goes by and, and you don't pay any attention to it because it's all lost anyway. No, he actually wants to indwell you. He wants you to be a testimony to the power of the gospel. And you have to understand that you don't deserve it, that you're far worse off than you could even fathom, but that you're also of greater value than you could ever imagine. You need to have those two things in tension on an ongoing basis. Apart from you, Christ, I can do nothing, is what Jesus taught the night that he was arrested. But with you, that the converse of that, but with you, I can do all things through you who gives me the strength to do those things that you want me to do right? I need to have a positive outlook, even in a very negative world. And you say, that's impossible. And I say, you are right. That is impossible for you in your flesh. The law of God will not do that through you, nor the law of sin. It's this law of the Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus Christ that comes and takes up residence in your heart, and it changes you from the inside out. And pretty soon people begin to see you and say, have you seen Doug recently? Look at his face. It like glows with Jesus Christ. You see, because we would much rather see a sermon than hear one any day. And everybody in the room said, be careful. <laughs> let's go to 1 Corinthians. In light of these truths, let's think together about communion. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 says this, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. 
Just a couple of thoughts here. First of all, there is not in the Bible something that says this is how often you should take communion. Twice in this passage it says as often as you do. So, so do, one of the things to do is not say, hey, the Catholics do it right, the Lutherans do it right, the evangelical church does it right. Th that's not the point. As often as you do it. I love it that we don't have the specifics oftentimes in the scripture because sometimes if there's too much specifics, we think, okay, we're doing it right and everybody else is doing it wrong. Huh? Can this happen? Yeah. And is that, that, that really causes unity of the spirit, doesn't it? Right? No, no, we develop denominations and we, you know, we look down our nose at those dang Lutherans, right? <laughs> or they look at an evangelical and think, what an evangelical fish they are right? Or, or we, we look at, you know, crazy Maddox, uh, char charismatics, right? We, don't we? And this, this, this table is to shut up the entire population under the mercy of God because all of us are disobedient in our sin. Every human being is. And God has shut us up in that trying to be obedient by giving us his mercy, but not only giving us his mercy, but every other human being who's in the same state as you are. Yeah, but I've been at a really good church forever. That does not count anything. I loved what James said last week, right? Just because you, you, know, you stand in a garage doesn't mean that eventually you'll become a car. Right? Let's go on, verse 27. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. And we're going to come back to what that means to partake in an unworthy manner. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Look at verse 29. I've never seen this before. You guys are a lot brighter than I am with your scriptures and you see things before I do likely. I'd never seen verse 29 the way that I have seen it this week. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, that's the part I had never meditated, had never studied that phrase in my whole life. And I've been doing this for 46 years, this walking with Jesus thing. Started when I was two and a half years old. Without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, remember that statement, I'm going to come back to it, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So this do not partake in an un unworthy manner. Examine yourself um, do you know, judge correctly about yourself. What does it even mean? It means if without this phrase, discerning the body without this phrase, this is what it means. But, but with this phrase, it changes. Okay, so don't think about, <laughs> all you're going to think about is discerning the body right now. Don't think about that right now, okay? So if you don't have that phrase in here, you're thinking communion is about me sitting in remorse in my sin, right? Unworthy. Examine yourself. Judge yourself, right? I mean, I'm about ready to like, who wants to do communion? Huh? And so when it has this phrase, discern the body, kind of tucked in the middle of this passage, that changes the narrative completely. The focus of communion the focus of breaking the bread, the focus of, of blood is not your body. It's not your blood. It is Jesus' body. It's Jesus' blood. It's about this law of the Spirit that Jesus Christ has given us to set us free. And so, so the, the, the word, it's an interesting word. Never studied the word before. The, the word for discerning. It means to separate thoroughly, to withdraw from or discriminate. It means to hesitate, doubt, judge, to be partial, to stagger, and even to waver. So, so the point of the word is this is the focus in communion, is to discern, is to concentrate, is to focus on the broken body of Jesus. You see, because we do this in remembrance of him, not in remembrance of how absolutely sinful I am, right? Right? 
We do this, we do this not to focus on the unforgiveness of our sin. We, we do this to, to focus on, oh my goodness, God has forgiven every one of my sins, past and present and future. And the focus is on, that's why the Catholics sometimes call communion Eucharist. It means, it means a, thank, a thanksgiving meal. The focus of communion is, is gratefulness. And so let me just read some statements that, that kind of came to my mind as I was thinking about communion this time. So the point being, stop and really think about the body of Christ. That's one of the things we must do if we're going to break the bread in the way that the scriptures teach us to break bread. Think those thoughts over and examine the meaning of his body. When you examine yourself, what you're doing is you're saying, self, yep, there I am. I am far worse off than I could ever fathom. Have you ever stayed there in communion? And pretty soon you're not even thinking about the body of Christ anymore. You're thinking, thinking of, the, of your shame, right? You're thinking of your, your failure. You think you go that direction, until you also recognize, but I am of, of such great, I'm, I'm more greatly loved than I could ever imagine. That needs to trump the first part all the time. You cannot go forth in your life with a life based on shame. That's why God sent Jesus to, to fix the Garden of Eden as we see it in Genesis chapter 3. As soon as they sinned, what did they do? They felt Oh, thank you, God, you loved me so much that you gave your son. No, they felt shame and they hid. We all know how to feel shame. Anybody not know how to feel shame? Just hang around, we'll help you. <laughs> right? We all know how to do that. Our problem is to live in victory. Christ is not calling you to live in shame. He's calling you and I to live in the power of his broken body, in the power of his blood, in the power of his resurrection, not in our sinfulness. That does not, don't hear me saying that there is not a wrong and a right. That is not what Pastor Joe believes. That's not what I live. But in terms of how to move forward, how to grow, how to mature as a human being, how to have victory over sin, the focus has to be on the victory of Jesus. That's the point of communion. Amen. It is not the point that I'm a sin, sinful person and that I'm never going to make it. It's the opposite of that. This is celebration. This, 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 this represents everything that every human being has ever truly needed, the only thing they've ever truly needed, to be fully known by God and to be fully loved by God at the same time. He knows our sin, and you know your sin, and by the way, you're pretty sure you know everybody else's sin too. Huh? We are by default have a sin detector built in. And that sin detector, either for myself, makes me feel ashamed, or when I think about other people, I shame them. This is not the way of the gospel, y'all. And we've done it too long, even within the body of Christ. Would you agree? We've got to stop that. And, and so, so, so communion is to be that reminder that breaks that chain. Devote yourself to it. Not only to understand what God's word says, not only to the fellowship, but Christ in the middle of that word and Christ in the middle of that fellowship and Christ in the middle of that devotion to prayer. It has to be the gospel that drives you and me. So, so this is how we examine ourselves, by focusing on Jesus' life, on his body, on his death, on his resurrection, examining by doing this by asking this, do I truly believe that Christ gave his body, his life for my life? That's a good way to examine yourself during communion. What am I thinking about when I think about the body of Christ? What, a, what an absolute sinner I am or what a righteous God and a loving God he is to come and to take me even in my sorry state. Do I believe that he is my only hope to, um, to live free of condemnation in, the, in this life and eternally with him in the next? That's what we think about in communion. We think about his body for me. 
This passage says, do this in remembrance of me, not in remembrance of sin and shame. Doesn't it? Communion is about remembering him, not about sin and shame. Sin and shame is real, and everybody knows that. We need, we need someone, and God is that person that's come and says, I get it. Yes, you are far worse off than, than I could even tell you, but you're of so much greater value, and I love you more than I could even, even communicate or you could even imagine. So don't let your shame, which is manufactured by Christ's enemy, by the way, that's who manufactured it in Genesis chapter 3, that's who's still manufacturing it today in this room, do not let your shame, which is manufactured by Christ's enemy, hijack your marveling at and celebrating what his broken body means for you. In Christ, we are made righteous. We're set free. We're made righteous and set free to live a life of extraordinary love, joy, peace, not because of circumstances, but because of Christ's victory and his love for you, for me. By his body and blood, you belong to your maker, not your shamer. That's what we're celebrating here. I do not, I know my sin. And it wants to direct, it wants to completely take over and marshal all of my life. And Jesus says, no, not when I am in your life. So we are proclaiming his victory, not rehearsing our lostness in this table. I'd like the band to come on up. And if you're serving, uh, you might want to kind of get ready too. So in communion, we are returning to the gospel message intentionally to be reminded of Christ, who Christ is and what he has done for us. Okay, that's what we're doing. Everybody with me? Secondly, we are also reminded of our desperation apart from him. It's only by you and only by your blood, Jesus. In order for communion to make any sense and make a difference to nourish us with God's grace, we must celebrate with these two absolute realities in mind. And maybe you've heard them already. You and I are far worse off than we can fathom. And we are far greater worth than we could imagine Jesus became sin for us. We are dead in our transgressions and sins, but God made us alive in Christ. This bread and this cup is to remind us of these four things. First of all, the incarnation. That Jesus took on flesh. He took on a body to live and to die, to rise for you. This bread is for you. This blood is for you. It's not for him. He is not coming in the bread and saying, look what an absolute loss you are. He's coming to you and saying, I love you more than you can imagine. We're to think about his substitution. Jesus died in our place, paid our debt, set us free. Hey, yeah, uh, you guys organize yourself and let's get those trays in here. Dan, go out there and tell him to, to stop talking. His substitution, Jesus died in our place, paid our debt, set us free so that we could truly live. Also, his restoration. It's not only his incarnation. That's awesome. It didn't stop there. It went on to a substitution, died for you. And then there's restora restoration. It's not just substitution. Okay, now you go. Do he lives in you. His grace continues to help you grow. Having begun with the Spirit, are you now trying to do it by your flesh? Don't do that. That's a bewitching. And sometimes that happens, right? Oh, well, I'm saved and the Spirit did His work. No, the Spirit is continuing to do His work of sanctifying you, helping you mature in Christ. And then it's about our response. It's about faith in Christ alone, to have no other gods beside Him, to worship, to worship Him with great thanksgiving. This is not a time for us to dwell on our sins, but to entirely be overcome by Christ's love, grace, and power for us. A time for us to celebrate his victory over death and sin and Satan for us. A time to discern his body.
We're going to focus on his body given for us, broken for us, intentionally, knowing your name before eternity, knowing the days of your life, knowing the moment you would be born and the moment that you would die, with you every step of the way, wooing you to himself, not through condemnation, but through his incredible grace and mercy. I think communion is supposed to change us. I think it's supposed to change our mind, to change our focus. C come on forward, you guys. Ladies, men, women. It's a time to discern his body, to marvel at his sacrifice, a time to be grateful, a time to do all of that together, a time to worship and bless him. It's also a time to bless one another. I like that sometimes we call it communion. It's not, it is the Lord's table, but at the Lord's table, who comes to the Lord's table? We all do. We all come there with the same need. It's a time to be devoted to the breaking of bread. You're free to take this communion. Uh, the only thing that we ask is that you have put your faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the only means of your salvation, and you put your trust in him. You don't have to be a member of this church or any church. You just need to belong to Jesus Christ. This is an open communion table for you. The focus, when you examine yourself, when you, when you attempt and you work towards not doing this in an unworthy manner, the way that you do that is to focus on the broken body of Jesus Christ. Discern his body. What did it mean? What does it mean for you? That becomes our focus. So, Father, thank you. Thank you that you loved us so much that even though we didn't deserve it, you came and you sent Jesus to die for us, to rise again for us. And Lord, so we take this, this bread and we give you thanks for it. Thank you for breaking your body for us. Thank you for being broken for us. Thank you for taking the pain and the penalty of sin for us. So take and eat in remembrance of Jesus. This cup represents his blood given for you. The focus is not on your sin in this blood. The focus is on his victory over your sin. So, Father, as we partake of this, I pray that you would, by your Holy Spirit, be doing work in every one of our hearts to trust you to arrest a shame-filled, a shame-driven life and replace that with a life that is, that is driven by your righteousness, by your love, by your forgiveness, by your mercy, by this new covenant in this blood. Take and drink in remembrance of Jesus. Let's stay in our worship.